Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. All my day. On Monday, September 26, 2022, a series of underwater explosions blew huge holes into the Nord Stream 1 and 2, two pairs of pipelines constructed to carry Russian natural gas to Germany under the Baltic Sea. These four pipelines, steel, reinforced, concrete cables built to withstand the direct impact of the anchor of an aircraft carrier, were destroyed in a clandestine act of sabotage, according to an investigation by Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter Seymour Hirsch. The pair of Nord Stream 1 pipelines carried Russian gas to Germany until Moscow cut off supplies at the end of August 2022. The pair of Nord Stream 2 pipelines, which would have doubled the amount of gas that would be available to Germany and Western Europe, were never operational as Germany suspended its certification process shortly before Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24, 2022. White House spokesperson Adrian Watson called Hirsch's report, quote, false and complete fiction. CIA spokesperson Tammy Thorpe said, quote, This claim is completely and utterly false. Denials by U.S. officials of covert operations, of course, are routine. Secretary of State Dean Rusk, for example, denied any U.S. involvement in the Bay of Pigs invasion in Cuba, assuring the American people that the invasion was not, quote, staged from American soil. When Seymour Hirsch in 2004 published the first stories about the torture of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib, A Pentagon spokesperson called his reporting, quote, a tapestry of nonsense, adding that Hirsch was a guy who, quote, threw a lot of crap against the wall and expects someone to peel off what's real. Despite the denials, the United States has long expressed hostility to the pipelines. It worked to prevent the completion of the pipelines and imposed illegal sanctions on enterprises engaged in its construction. President Biden, on February 7, 2022, prior to the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, stated, quote, if Russia invades, there will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it. During a Senate hearing, Victoria Nuland, Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs, was asked by Senator Ted Cruz whether his legislation aimed at sanctioning the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline which was voted down in January of 2022, could have stopped the war. Like you, I am, and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea, Newland said. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken described the destruction of the pipelines as a, quote, tremendous opportunity which would enable EU countries to become less dependent on Russian energy. The New York Times reported in December that Russia had begun expensive repairs on the pipelines, raising questions about Washington's claim that Russia had bombed its own infrastructure. These explosions are not insignificant acts. They are acts of war. They expose not only the collapse of the rule of law, but the lack of oversight by Congress. I covered the mining of Nicaragua's harbors in 1983 by the Reagan administration as a reporter in Central America. The mining was designed to cripple the economy in Nicaragua and boost the fortunes of the U.S.-backed Contra rebels seeking to overthrow the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. The mining backfired. It sparked outrage around the globe and saw Congress cut off funding for the Contras a year later. The International Court of Justice in 1986 ruled against the United States over its mining of the harbors. Hirsch's revelations should have led to a similar condemnation by Congress and an internal investigation into illegal activities by the CIA and the Pentagon. It should have prompted news organizations to dig deeper into a scandal 
a flagrant violation of the UN Charter and international treaties. It should have prompted a national debate about the war in Ukraine and the steady escalation of our involvement, one that could lead to a direct confrontation with Russia and possibly nuclear war. Joining me to discuss his latest investigative piece is Seymour Hirsch, one of our most important and fearless investigative reporters who, among many groundbreaking stories, exposed the U.S. Army's 1969 My Lai massacre and cover-up, the Watergate scandal, the secret bombing of Cambodia, the torture by U.S. soldiers at Abu Ghraib of Iraqi prisoners, and the false narrative told by the U.S. government about the events surrounding the killing of Osama bin Laden. So, Sai, let's talk about why the U.S. destroyed the pipelines. And in your story, you uh, write that they began preparing the destruction of the pipelines two months before the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And then if you can also explain why they saw the pipelines as a threat. Well, you're getting to the core of it. Uh, and actually, if you wonder why people on the inside might have talked to me about this, it's because of their disillusionment with what the Obama administration did. The initial plan to do was the initial idea of a covert team to set up to look at the uh, uh, had nothing. The initial team was set up only to give options. And that was before Christmas of 19, 2021. Uh, we were three months away or two and a half months away from the invasion. And but the Russian, the, the uh, Putin, et cetera, was already uh, moving forces into Belarus. So, so something was on. And the idea was uh, Jake Sullivan convened, convened a group, uh, the usual CIA, NSA, State Department, Treasury Department, uh, Joint Chiefs of Staff, a small group uh, meeting at a, a very secret place they have in the executive office building. And I, I did mention specifics there because I wanted people to know that I knew specifics because I knew there would be resistance to the story I was writing, which I didn't learn about till after the after the bombing took place last September. Uh, at that time, it was just a question of the 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 word of art, the language of it was very specific our language. They were told to discuss uh, kinetic or you know uh, re, the way it was actually put was we want reversible and irreversible options. That was the literal language, the, art, the artful language used. And the reversible options would be more sanctions, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, ask, ask Cuba about sanctions. You know, they've been sanctioned since 61. Yeah, yeah, right. And the sanctions as they didn't work out in Russia too, the current one. And the uh, irreversible would be something kinetic. So within a couple of weeks, it was clear the, the people who advocated for us uh, won the game, and they, they were thinking of military options, and they had all sorts of crazy options. We had learned in the in the Vietnam War, uh, we mined Haiphong Harbor by dropping um, uh, mines from a, from a bomb with uh, timers on them, we, from airplanes. We, uh, it's amazing. The, the state of art of mine warfare has grown up an, enormously. And so the option was blow up the pipeline. That's the one option you can give. And they told the White House, I would guess, I don't know specifics, but certainly by uh, mid-January, they were saying, okay, it's possible because people there knew of the capability. We had a, a very superior uh, school in um, down in the Panhandle of Florida, somewhere in, uh, near something called Panama City. There was a big Navy school for divers, and Navy divers, uh, not, not SEALs, they were Navy-trained divers, and they had been skilled in the art of blowing up uh, an oil rig we don't might we might not like you know good and the bad they could also clear harbors but they were experts and we knew we had the experts who could bomb could mine anything even a pipeline but how to do it wasn't clear but they told the White House in January they had made a connection with Norway uh, the Norwegian Navy goes back to the Vietnam War with us really I, I've written about that as you probably know they yeah. go back to the provocation that led to the Gulf of Tonkin resolution led to this whole horrible war. There's an analogy. I'm writing about it because we're in an analogous situation with the Lyndon Johnson having the right by lying and doing something deceitful, um, uh, uh, pretending that North Vietnam had blown, attacked an American uh, destroyer, which it had not, uh, and put us into a war that, you know, as we like to say, killed between two and three Vietnamese as if between one million or two million isn't such a big deal. Anyway, whatever. 
whatever racist intonation you want to give it, it's there. And in this case, so um, uh, they came up with an option that was, it was all a terribly secret program that they were doing with, they were working with the Norwegians. That's never been made public and, and until actually, as I, as I mentioned, I wrote about in another Substack piece and, and uh, the extent to which Norway is in our pocket and uh, on this stuff. And so, um, uh, well, let, question, me, let so, me ask why though, why? Let me just, move, let me yeah. just finish the thought. Yeah. The issue is uh, initially it was gonna, it was just gonna be a threat. They, the, the Putin uh, that the, and the, the hostility from Putin had been growing with American Americans respond to President you know, yipping and yapping about a bad guy and the, the uh, Putin Putin was a dead letter man you know in America right now um, right now it's you can't talk about him any rational way um, but the question was um, uh, once they told the White House that both the president and the undersecretary uh, for political affairs, uh, um, um, uh, whatever her name is, um, Victoria Newland, uh, Victoria Newland, whose husband is one of the Robert, original Robert Kagan. Kagan. Robert Kagan. Yeah, Kagan is one of the guys that thought the solution to Al Qaeda bombing us in the 9 11 was to, was to attack our <laughs> uh, radical hating Saddam. <laughs> right. You know, anyway, whatever, the worst mistake probably made in modern history, even worse, probably in the long term, maybe worse than Vietnam because of uh, the consequences that we still are looking at. Anyway, um, the, 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 the only point was that their idea was to construct a, a, a mechanism to put pack, back down put, Bob, um, uh, Putin. We're going to destroy the second pipeline. The first pipeline, there are two. The first one which went into business in 9-11, supplying Europe, uh, Europe with gas, cheap gas, a lot of it, was cut back, was stopped by uh, Putin himself um, um, in 2021 or 20, just um, because of the language we were using. The second one was stopped by us with the new pipeline, Nord Stream 2, uh, had been finished in 2020 or 21 and had been sanctioned by Germany. So we had a pipeline that could have been opened by the Germans, but it had been sanctioned. and so. Biden drops the gives the order to bomb it, and, and it's it's destroyed on September the twenty sixth, months after the. And these guys, had, I don't know whether they were in in had just backed off, or when he, I don't know how whether they had to go back and put everything online. But they thought it was a dead letter issue, so he does it, uh, and um, on his command, that's what people in the CIA do. They they respond to the crown and not to the constitution. Uh, something I mentioned in the first story, and uh, with a sense of doom, and he blew it up. And so I've done a lot of thinking, a lot of reporting on what was going on in late September that would have changed the equation. By blowing up the German pipeline, he was saying we've we've there's no natural gas or oil in West Europe. We and there's been a constant worry going back to the Kennedy days about Russian and their great reservoir of natural gas and oil. Uh, weaponizing gas to maintain good relationships with Germany. We never liked that. We never liked the fact that that uh, Germany was so dependent on Russian uh, and Western Europe on Russian fuel. That always bothered us, particularly uh, Cheney, uh, uh, Cheney worried about it. Uh, Condoleezza Rice spoke often about it in the uh, Bush-Cheney years. Uh, Biden, when he was uh, vice president, chaired a committee that continued. This is not a new idea, trying to remove the uh, it's not a new idea to remove this link that would give the, the the Russians some 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 power inside Europe. That was always a nagging issue for us in the Cold War, the world of containment, and the, this whole facade of containment that we think has worked but has not. Anyway, that's another story. And so what happened is, and the best I can get, and the people I talk to, obviously, I'm you know I'm longer tooth here in Washington, and so I know a lot of people. And the, in, the, the whole intelligence picture I'm seeing, particularly by late September, is so different than what's being written in the, the Times, the Washington Times and the Washington Post. It's like it's another world. They're so dependent on the, the paper on briefings from, I guess, from the Biden people. I don't know where they're getting the stuff they publish. 
But by late September, there had been a wonderful alleged victory when the when the Russians retreated and the Ukrainians ran across, you know, um, dozens of miles of territory. But I will tell you that by late September, at the best, it was going to be a very dark stalemate with no victory possible. And Zelensky, not willing to negotiate, he had backed off and he was in his own little world of total corruption, the corruption of Ukraine. I mean, it's so bad that the worry we've had in the community is that he was in trouble with the generals because he was taking too much of the swag. His, his cut was too big. I'm serious. So I'm in that level of information that is really good. And I know it's real. And meanwhile, the papers are talking about, you know, uh, whatever they're talking about. Sometimes there's a hint of darkness. So in September, I, I think I will give you what I believe is the rationale for what he did, which is he wanted to prevent Germany, which has always, right now there was, in case you care, there were two large marches in Berlin last weekend. One, the the police said 30, 15,000 or 13,000 and the and the newspaper people and the, the people running the protest was much closer to 50,000. Tremendous amount against the war, not about the pipelines, but against giving more to this war because of the danger it posed. They did a march on Saturday and Sunday they went to the um, uh, the, the the largest American base in, in near, uh, in or near Berlin, Mannheim and surrounded it and also protested. And apparently, on one in some embassy, whether I don't, I don't remember whether it was ours or not. They had a destroyed Russian tank on display, and they took down with the display, and they put flowers and peace signs on it over that weekend. Not a word in the Western press, not a word in the New York Times. Not it was a big story in the, the media in Europe, and certainly even in London had good stories on it. Not a word here. It's like, it's like there's some sort of. Um, um, uh, a uh, nimbus, <laughs> a dark cloud over us. Anyway, so I think, I mean, the best guess you have, and I, I would guess ninety percent this is is good, is that that Biden was frightened that if he saw a long war coming, Germany, which was reluctant to rearm after World War II, after all they spent a decade murdering, raping, and killing in Western Europe, among other places, their allies now are all in NATO. So I, I think what he did is he told NATO and he told Western Europe and he told Germany, um, we no longer have your back. We've always had your back. We no longer have it. You can't count on us anymore because this president thinks his war in Ukraine is more important than making you, giving you the German government, the, the ability, not this winter, but next winter is going to be a tough one, the ability to keep the, the factories going and people warm. Now, right now in Germany, the price of electricity is so rational. Uh, it's it's there's and the government is subsidizing up to twenty percent in some places more. Uh, so people that particularly in larger cities and the corporations, but the largest corporation and the chemical company in the world just cut back production. It's been talking to China about moving some facilities there because they can't predict. Be, they don't have a predictable. You know, the oil, the gas that Russia was pumping in Nord Stream One was cheap and plentiful and German so much that German the German corporations that were getting the that were were that handled the gas were selling it downstream and making a profit about which Russia did care not the pipeline Nord Stream one uh which was such a boon to the European economy was run by was owned 51 percent by Gazprom uh, oligarchs who kicked back a great deal of money to Russia. To give you some idea how much money that was being produced for Russia and for Gazprom One, it was uh, one year forty-five billion dollars was 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 funneled into the Russian economy by Gazprom. Forty-nine percent of it, the company was owned by. Uh, we're talking about stockholders. Was owned by four European countries that sold the the cheap gas downstream. So it was a big operation, and they lost Nord Stream One. Nord Stream 2 was going to pick it back up so that he, Biden did this, what some people call an act of war, at least the people involved think it was an act of war who did the planning for it, uh, because uh, he no longer trusted West Europe to, to support him and his venture in Ukraine, which I think he, which the only thing he can think is that presidents in wars always are popular. That's, you know, a war is sustained presence. We've seen that. We've seen that historically uh, that, uh, they you know, uh, Bill Clinton came into office with uh, one uh, don't tell, don't, don't, you know, don't, uh, you know, the, with the attitude of allowing gays in the military. There was tremendous resistance. 
and he was in the first couple of months were just a disaster. He he probably should have fired some of the members of the Joint Chief who were openly critical of him, but he didn't do that. He waffled. But on May in May, I think it was, he he authorized the bombing of Baghdad. The first time we the Americans have ever we've ever bombed a, a major capital in in the Middle East, and there was killed eight people which I remember one official telling me only eight. And I said to him, what if one of them was your, your third, your, 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 uh, his son played on a ball team with mine. That's how I knew him, Sandy Berger. Sandy was deputy national security advice. He, I was, I came in there with, do a story about what they did. And he said, what are you worrying about? They're only eight. And I said, one of them was one of your son that played third base with my kid, you know, my kid's baseball team. And he said, get out of this office. <laughs> you know, literally I'd never, no, Republicans never done that to me, even in the Bush, even the in the in the uh, um, uh, in the days of Watergate. Nobody. Uh, there's always a manner of polite. He said, "Get out of my office." Somebody I'd known for 20 years, and that's so. And so Biden does the bombing. I mean, uh, Clinton. And the next day was a Saturday, and on Sunday I'm watching. He goes to church, and he's followed by cameras going to church. It was his best day in the White House. He'd actually bombed and killed people, and that was his best day. And I, I remember that stuck in my mind forever. That's, a, you know, that's where we're at with this presidency we have right now. The best day he thinks is going to come uh, when he wins in whatever his fantasy is about Ukraine. It is terrifying. But he's losing the war. They're losing the war. The Russians. Well, I don't, I don't know if, you know, if, uh, I think if you watch the Times and Post like I do, uh, I think it's, they're beginning to back off. But they still run nothing. You know, I, I love the stories about Russians raping and brutality. Uh, there's is there an army that doesn't rape and brutalize? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, are you kidding? Yeah, yeah. Do you think what do you think what happens when a Russian soldier is captured by the Ukrainians? Right. <laughs> They're given blankets and 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 hot coffee. Well, I or mean, or those the Ukrainians uh argue are collaborators. What happens to them? Well, you're talking about that famous story about that first village. Yeah. Uka. Well, and where they the, the the reporters were taken by the but they never mentioned that they were taken by representatives of of uh, of the Ukrainian government to this village. Yes, um, my understanding. I haven't written this because I I I I, I follow the war, but I, I I haven't been writing about it during the uh, COVID days. I was I've been doing a big project on containment going back to China in '54. I mean, it's fascinating. How how dumb we are have been all along with our co- anti-communist stuff. But anyway, I'm back I'm back in Vietnam too a lot. But um, but uh, their armbands there was just tell they put armbands around certain people, and there was a lot of reporting in the European press not here that many of the people who were executed so badly had had been been accused of being uh, Russian supporters or collaborators by the Ukrainians. So they were killed, and not necessarily by the retreating Russian troops. But I assure you, there are abuses by troops everywhere. I'm mean, rapist. That's one of the virtues of being a soldier, you know. In every war, don't, you know, don't think we're any better than anybody else. We don't. I don't. We know we're not. I mean, Milai told me that. I went light on on the sex stuff at Milai. I just didn't want mm-hmm. when I wrote my stories. I I didn't want every South Vietnamese soldier to wake up after reading what really happened and getting his revolver and going hunting down an American soldier. Yeah. I was worried about that. The war was still on. Soldiers do awful things. Yeah, yeah, I know. I and you know, and both sides lie you. both sides lie like they breathe. I, I want to ask about the Navy's diving and salvage center, which you mentioned. Uh because as, as you said, it's not part of America's special operations command. But it was selected for a reason, not solely because of its expertise, uh, but because, as you write in your story, it allowed the administration not to brief Congress. Well, when you're working with the CIA and the NSA on secret operations, there is a, a law. You have to you have to do the CIA in particular has to do a finding that has to be presented to Congress. It's to this. It, basically, it's to a clerk on a subcommittee of appropriations that's only has four members on it. I mean, it's a very, still a very contained operation, uh, but it's it has to be briefed. And you also have to brief the Gang of Eight, which is what they call the uh, the House and Senate leaders of both parties and the House and Senate members of the uh, Intelligence Committee. And there hasn't been any um, uh, eh, eh, 
any collaboration or any co uh, 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 any good feelings between the two of them uh, since Bush got since uh, Trump got in. Uh, you know, I'm mean, are you kidding? And I would you think about I, if you're Biden and you want to run a, a down and dirty program. You want to do you want to brief Speaker McCarthy about it? I don't think so. But whatever case is, once the reason they pick the um, the the divers who are skilled, it's a it's a school. You pick people that have been trained by them. By the way, the whole trick of an operation like this is very few. You only needed two divers, but you had to pick good ones who not necessarily were at the school, but they've been trained by the school and have been in the field doing good and bad, as I wrote. Anyway, um, the, the, once you 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 don't go to the Navy SEALs because they're in the Special Operations Command and that requires a, a finding. So they, look, this is all just word games because I, I, I wrote a lot for the New Yorker after when Bush and Cheney were in running ops, they never briefed anything to the Congress. They just said, screw this law, you know, who cares? But um, uh, under Biden, uh, it was very convenient to say to once Biden spoke out about the operation, and once you only had people there who were from the Navy doing the diving, not SEALs, um, and once you actually had, even if somebody, you actually had, uh, you hadn't told the Joint Chiefs much about this because they have to respect certain laws, you can decide it's no longer a covert operation, it's now a classified operation. And under rulings they have, the CIA can bring in an army unit, a military unit, into an operation that's classified without briefing Congress. That's just all games and words. Uh, but that is so. That's what they did. They were very, in a way, Biden's shooting off his mouth. Biden in February, after they gave him a briefing, went public and was asked about, he was trying to stop Russia. We can stop Nord Stream 2. We know we can, and we will when we can. That kind of language was used. By the way, not one reporter has asked the White House about that since those, those early expressions. Not one reporter. They just don't do it. And there was, it was interesting to me that four days, I didn't know anything about this then. I was just following it. Four days after the September 26 bombing, which I do think was aimed at keeping Europe away from being tied to Russia um, because of this longstanding worry about the Russian weaponization is the word we use. Four days later, Jake Sullivan, who had convened the initial meeting, had a news conference. He was asked, not right away, I was amazed, not till 11 minutes, I, I looked at the tape, was he asked about the bombing under the sea? And he said, yes, he said, uh, do, do, and the, 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 I don't know what, what they're feeding the press corps today, but <laughs> the question was asked in such a way, do you think Russians did it? What? Right. <laughs> you know, as somebody said to me about the story I wrote, um, um, a, a friend of mine that's much smarter than I am, um, uh, given that the uh, Newland and and Biden had both in January and February talked about the possibility of doing once they learned it was possible from the secret world, which was really upsetting to the guys in the secret world doing it. Uh, once they said that, anyway. <laughs> Uh, you think somebody would ask that question, but instead the first question asked was, uh, uh, do you think the Russians did it? And Sullivan, who had convened the meeting, knowing exactly what happened, uh, his answer was, I, I love this. He said, uh, well, you know, it's like them because they're immediately accusing us and, you know, denying us. That seems to be the way the Russians operate. But I will tell you, the Janes and the Swedes are doing an investigation and that's, let's wait and see until it happens. So a month later, the Danes and Swedes in October 16th, I think, uh, <laughs> I didn't even mention this in the article, it's too stupid to be believed. They announced that they had studied the event for, for weeks and weeks, and they concluded there was indeed an underwater explosion. <laughs> that, was their, that was their study. And so here's the question I've asked, here's the question, that the next time there's a news conference, I so ask, I please, please some reporter ask this question. Well, Mr. President, um, you're the president and you have the right, uh, uh, the absolute right to, to, uh, to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, it demand, uh, it's called, I, I don't, there's a, two, a word of Hartford that skips my mind. He can, he can make a request. He can, um, uh, he can ask the head of uh, intelligence, uh, the office of national intelligence has an intelligence. They're the, they're the top, they're the top dogs. Uh, it's called the, uh, national, the head of national intelligence runs all the community. Um, and he can ask them 
uh, he can compel him to, um, to do a study of what happened and who did the bombing. And, and he can also ask uh, the, the, the CIA has an office called the Director of Intelligence, along with Operations and Science and Technology, which produces a lot of good stuff. There are a lot of bright guys working there. He can ask them to, to, to do a study. And, uh, and if the CIA, when it has people in the field like they did in Norway, has a team, I used to be called the C team. It's all very secret. I'm sure they change everything every week, but there is a team there that does the monitoring. If we have a team abroad, they monitor like local phone calls, everything to make sure nobody's figured out there's something on going on, a very high intense operation. Make a study. He's never, he's never asked anybody to do anything. Why don't you ask if he's at, you know, just ask. And the answer will be, of course they haven't because they know the answer. Right, right. I mean, it's really, this is such a dumb lie they're into. And they're going to just lie the rest of the way because there's, why not? Let's talk about the reaction. Let's talk about the reaction. And in particular, the reaction of news organizations. Um, as you, when you and I worked at the Times, if somebody, Washington Post, broke a major story, uh, we had to dig uh, to find out whether we could match it. If we couldn't match it, we had to acknowledge that the Post ran it. The Times hated doing that. Um, but this reaction is frightening. I, I'm sure you find, I find it frightening, but I'll let you take it from there. I mean, it's, I've been just kind of, I find it kind of staggering. Well, the problem, with, you're right. In the early days, I'll tell you something else we did when I was at the Times. Um, um, everybody screws up a story. I screwed up a story about um, uh, a certain ambassador during the Chile crisis, and he was a friend of uh, he was a friend of the paper. And uh, Abe Rosenthal, the editor, had visited him. He was the ambassador. Ed Corey was the ambassador to Ethiopia at the time, and he had been in Chile, and he had been involved in. There were two aspects to the Chilean operation we did to get at Allende. I mean, we. Um, um, uh, the idea that Allende's death was a suicide is not, not possible for me to believe. We were after Allende, but there were two levels. There was a propaganda level that the ambassador ran, ranting about him and calling him out. And then there was a secret level of actually paying people to kill people that he was not cut in because he wasn't trusted by the station because he was sort of a motor mouth at Corey. And so um, as a reporter, when I, I wrote the story, the first story about Chile and the CIA involvement and Kissinger was angry and all that stuff, he was involved. And, um, uh, and uh, there was a Senate committee led by Frank Church who later read, investigated uh, another story I did, the Church Committee uh, after domestic spying. And he started, he put out, a, his committee put out a report and I like uh, 50 other reporters, um, I was following the story, wrote a piece for the New York Times about the Senate committee said this and that about this Chile stuff. And Corey, I mentioned, they had mentioned Corey as being involved in the actual more, more aggressively than just, or just propaganda. And he, of course, went nuts about it. And even though I had done the same thing others did, he focused on me and he was right. Uh, I later learned that he was cut out. I later learned that he was cut out of, uh, of anything involved, the killing stuff, because they didn't trust the ambassador, which happens. And so I wrote, a, a, I was then working on a book on, on a Kissinger, and it was 81. I'd been out of the paper for a couple of years. And I told Abe, well, you know what? Uh, uh, we screwed this guy over in, on page one, even though it was I wrote the report, six other, eight other people did, but so I wrote it, and he you know, New York Times was the New York Times. And so we did a front page correction. I wrote a 3,000 word port, not only correcting that he wasn't in it, but describing why he wasn't in it. That was as a way to write another story about what really happened. And we put it on page one. And the response of the peers was pretty much ignoring this sort of exceptional thing that I wrote a 3,000 story saying, you know, I screwed up stuff. But there was a reason for it, which has made it better. The, the Time magazine. They they did they ridiculed the ridiculing piece they the three thousand word oops, right? They'd run the same story they did I did earlier a couple of years earlier on the Senate committee, and so A. Rosenthal said to me I'll never forget it he said I'm never going to show uh, he used a vulgar word for rear end I never oh he said I'm never going to show my ass to those guys again you know screw them all I'm not done with no more corrections they, if this is the way they behave you know we, you know I spent a month doing it. I'm, I'm sure I got paid minimal money. It wasn't about money. You know, I wasn't on the staff. Uh, so, but 
so I saw that. Uh, even then, you're right. Even until then, the Times uh, covered things that they didn't report. It, it was of note. But I, I would say that's disappeared totally long before I, I wrote stuff. I mean, I, uh, when I was doing stuff for The New Yorker um, uh, after 9-11, um, I was doing a lot of stories because I have access, all with unnamed sources. But of course, The New Yorker knows the sources. And the people, and by the way, I'm working with New Yorker checkers right now and, a, and an editor who used to be, uh, uh, was my editor on London Review of Books when I wrote a bunch of stuff for them. And so um, uh, they stopped ch chasing stories back then. Um, in I thought after 9-11, you know, they just, you know, I, I had a wonderful friend of mine that was on the paper called me and said, well, we all were called in Sunday about this story and we called everybody. We can't match it, so we're going to forget it. I said, what? He said, I know, it's crazy, but they're not going to do it. So it's just an old, values change. And it changed then. And it's it, what, right now what they're doing is they're putting America in jeopardy. I, I mean, that's a serious charge to make. The Times has a special obligation, it's stature. And it, has, it still has the staff. The, the print circulation is way down, as you probably know, down to 330,000, it was 1.7 million. But they're doing great. They have an online reading you know, that's, I still get the paper. I'm old fashioned. My wife's been reading it online since it started because it's easier for her. Um, I still get the print and I like to feel it and I like to read it that way. But um, it's got an obligation to the American, you know, the one fight I had with Rosenthal when I worked there that was never resolved wasn't about the paper's instinctive anti-communism. It was about the fact that they they weren't an American newspaper. They, they were, they, you know, none of this, American exceptionalism, they're an international newspaper and they shouldn't cover things from the American point of view as they do. I was all, that was a big fight I had, just an intellectual fight. That you're, you're, making, you're making a mistake, you're bigger than that. You gotta start covering the story from a world point of view. And they didn't, they didn't they, he thought I was nuts. Well, they, they, uh, I'm just gonna stop there for a minute, but I mean, they, uh, I mean, he Rosenthal, a very problematic figure. I mean, those were the glory days, it's, it's so diminished in terms of its integrity, its ethics, and the quality of its journalism, whether Jeff Gerth, of course, is a great piece. We did an interview with Jeff on the Russia-Trump saga, two years, four years of slogging uh, what was uh, salacious, salacious gossip as news, the Caliphate podcast, all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, David Hebden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. That was Cy Hirsch, who you can also find at Substack. <laughs>